So friends, it's good to have you back. Um, today we're in week two of the Upper Room Discourse. We're covering the second half of John 14, um, verses 15 through 31. Let me pray for us as we get started. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the way that you keep teaching us and keep revealing yourself to us. Um, help us to listen and learn from you. Um, please give me just the right words today and um, help us all to go away knowing you a little bit better. Thank you, Lord. So this week we have a lot to say about the themes that love is obedience, so obedience is love, about the Holy Spirit, about being together with the Trinity, which is being against the world, as it turns out. Um, and so three themes, um, love is obedience, introduction to the Trinity, Holy Spirit 101, together against the world. And we're kind of going to circle around through the verses a little bit because Jesus' themes circle around here too. Remember that this is a continuous speech um, with where we left off last time. So as we start out in verse 15, we need to see it tied to verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. That is, observe, guard, treat as precious. Keep your eyes focused on my orders, which I give you with authority. He says it again in verse 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And again in verse 23. If you love me, you'll keep my word. Jesus shows us the other side of the coin in verse 24. The one who does not follow me or does not love me, does not follow my words. And we're not alone in obeying. Listen to verse 31. So that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Jesus asks us to obey him in the same way that he obeys the Father. Jesus is saying that for him, obedience is the product of love. Obedience is love. Love is obedience. In the context of other relationships, that's a pretty scary thing to say, and we don't have to look very far for ugly examples. But if it's obedience towards God, our maker who deserves our worship, our father who loves us, our good shepherd who's taking care of us in his perfect way, we can accept it. Obeying our loving God may not always look safe, but we know it's the safest course of action. Anything that helps in our relationship with God, anything we can contribute to it, frankly, is a great investment in our future. And there's something we should notice here. Again, Jesus is equating himself with God. The level of obedience he asks of us is the same as what we owe to God. Jesus' words about love and obedience are awfully similar to what God said to Moses over and over again. Listen to this cluster of verses from Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children, even on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing favor to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his faithfulness to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. Um, Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments, his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Deuteronomy 11.13, listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and your soul, and then good things will happen. Um, Deuteronomy 11.22, keep all of this commandment, which I am commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and cling to him. And again, the following verses say good things will happen. Love and keep the commandments. The commandment is to love the Lord. Obedience is love. Love is obedience. Those who love God, obey him. Those who are not interested in a relationship with God, don't bother. But for those who love and obey God, good things happen. Great things happen. Things beyond our wildest dreams, beyond what anyone would dare to ask, because God wants relationship with us. 
He wants us to be together, to be an us with us. He, and he takes it all the way, bringing us into his mutual indwelling. Um, look at how this happens. In verse 16 and 17, Jesus says, The helper, the Holy Spirit, will abide, will dwell with you forever. He will be in you. In verse 18, Jesus promises the disciples they wouldn't be orphaned. He would come back to them as he did on Easter and as he will again. In verse 19, Jesus says they will see him, though the world doesn't. In verse 20, in that day you'll know that I'm in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Last week we talked about how Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus. This week is part two. Jesus is in the Father. The Father is in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is in us. We are in Jesus. Jesus is in us. Together forever. Mutual indwelling and mutual love. In verse 19, we live because Jesus lives. Just like Colossians 3, 3 through 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. On in verse 21, Jesus tells us that those who love and obey Jesus are loved by the Father and by Jesus, and Jesus promises to reveal himself to them, to show them who he truly is. Judas, hereafter known as Judas not Iscariot, interrupts, confused. But Jesus, why bother revealing yourself to us and not to the world? How will the Roman oppressors know to go away? How will our national leadership know to get in line behind you? How are you going to save us without doing it publicly? Jesus patiently answers, Judas, not Iscariot, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and the Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me does not follow my words. And it's the Father's word, actually. He says it's not a political power grab. It's a spiritual invasion. God wants to be at home with us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to dwell with us. They'll even bring their own couch. Move in ready. <laughs> and this is profound. Who would have thought that God's goal was domestic happiness? It starts right now, right here, and it comes to complete perfection in Revelation 21, 2 through 3. I'm reading from the NLT. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. God himself will be with them. Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus had been with them, but he was finishing up his earthly ministry. So Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit. Still a 101 class, just applicable basics. Now the Holy Spirit was not new on the scene. God the Spirit appears frequently in the Old Testament and was active in people's lives before Jesus went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Jesus tells his disciples in um, verse 17 in our passage, that the Holy Spirit is someone they already know, but who is going to be in them. He uses different descriptions of the Holy Spirit here, the helper, the spirit of truth, and he talks about what his role is going to be. It's good to notice here that Jesus uses a personal pronoun when talking about the Holy Spirit. Pronouns are important here. He is a person, not an it, not a use the force, Luke. Um, <laughs> Jesus describes tasks the Holy Spirit will do once he is in Jesus' followers, abiding with you forever in verse 17. Difficult to catch in the NASB, but basically being at home with you forever. And in verse 26, teaching you all things and reminding you of all I said to you. Last week we talked about a few new theology words. This week we're going to talk about a really important one, paraclete, which John uses to describe an important role of the Holy Spirit. So paraclete is the English pronunciation of parakletos, a Greek word made by combining para, beside or alongside, and kalein, to call. Someone called to one side. It's actually a legal term, meaning someone called to help in a court of law. Specifically, it was used to refer to a person of high social standing who came to the court to speak on behalf of a defendant in front of a judge. Rene Kiefer explains that this word was used in the Jewish tradition for angels, prophets, and righteous people who were seen as advocates in God's court, but it also had the meaning one who consoles. The noun paraclete only appears in the Bible in the books John wrote and mostly in the upper room discourse, but the, as the verb parakaleo appears frequently throughout the New Testament. 
Depending on which Bible translation you're using, parakletos is translated in John 14, 16, and 26 as helper or counselor or comforter or advocate. In John 14, 16, Jesus says that the Father will give his followers at Jesus' request another parakletos, another because Jesus was currently acting as helper, counselor, comforter, and advocate, and the Holy Spirit would be filling his shoes. The Holy Spirit is right next to us, at home with us, living in us, in all our struggles and joys. He comforts and counsels us. He does legal things for us, like how Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Testifies is legal, standing as a witness. He intercedes for us in prayer, according to Romans 8, 26 through 27. The Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pause and be encouraged right there. I may not know how to pray right, and neither did Paul, but God the Holy Spirit prays for us to help us because he knows we need the help. And he prays for us according to God's will. His prayers are so much better than mine because the Holy Spirit is not limited by my vocabulary and because he's a lot more interested in God's will than I am and because he's God. Don't get me wrong, you should pray for me too, but what a great prayer, what a powerful prayer it is to have the Holy Spirit always praying on our behalf. In addition to being called the paraclete, Jesus also calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. Jesus is the truth, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And according to verse 26, he's our teacher, and he brings Jesus' words to mind when we need them. What a good person to have on our side. And it is about sides. As we continue through the upper room discourse, Jesus really shows us where the line is between us and them. Happily, us is Jesus' followers, the Holy Trinity, everyone who's obeying God. Them is the world and the ruler of the world, those who are rebelling against God. Jesus says in verse 17 that the world can't receive the Holy Spirit because it can't see the Holy Spirit, literally can't be spectators to him, can't see what he does. And the world doesn't know him, but the disciples already know him, and the Holy Spirit is at home with them and will be in them. He'll teach them everything and remind them of all Jesus said to them. That must have made them nervous, that talk about Jesus leaving and a spirit replacing the, him. But look at Jesus' total calm at the end of our passage. Peace I leave you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. In verse 28, you should be happy I'm going. I'm telling you ahead of time so you believe when it happens. We're right on schedule. Everything that's about to happen is because I'm going to obey the Father because I love him. Peace. Jesus was on mission and totally confident that the Father's will was playing out, and he was going to show the world that he loves the Father. I want to unpack just a couple things in this last paragraph. First, when we hear Jesus say peace, we should hear shalom. I'm not so addicted to Hebrew words, but shalom is a really rich one. It comes from a root that means safety, but shalom gets a much bigger and broader meaning. Shalom is not just tranquility or absence of conflict, it's not neutral, it's actually positive. Shalom is rich blessing, is all is well, is wholeness, health, thriving like Kaiser, and especially a wonderful relationship with God. A covenant of peace and friendship with God. You could say it's salvation. The true reconciliation with God, which Jesus purchased with his death, which is the inheritance of his heirs, us. It's peace that grows and grows. First, it's peace with God, like in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's peace with others, like in Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall about how Jews and Gentiles, people from different ethnic and religious backgrounds were coming together as Christians united by Christ. And it's peace within our own hearts, like in Romans 8, 6. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And we know that kind of peace is a testimony to those around us when we go through rough times. A second point we should touch on is Jesus' statement in verse 28. The Father is greater than I. Here we have to accept two things that sound contradictory, 
but Jesus said them both, so they both have to be true. The first is something we've seen a lot in this study, that Jesus claims equality with God the Father. For instance, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. And all of Jesus' I am statements and early in our passages demand for obedience at the same level that we owe to God the Father. As we read through the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit will get similar treatment as really and truly divine, not as less than God or a lesser manifestation of God, equal with the Father and Jesus without being the same person. Theologians call this the co-equality of the Trinity. So what does Jesus mean by the Father is greater than I? Well, one thing that we can know is we hear Jesus saying over and over that the Father sent him, the Father tells him what to do and what to say. So it's pretty easy to say that the person who's sending and commanding and giving the orders is acting as greater than in authority and leadership. Um, that brings us to Philippians 2, 6 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So there you have it. Jesus, though equal with God the Father, submitted himself and obeyed. So he deserves our worship and praise. Um, there's evidence that this passage was actually a hymn in the early church. And we have a hymn like this too, about how he emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's something race. <laughs> Desperate race? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. But it's there. I know it is. Um, the final words in this passage actually give commentators a headache. They get translated, get up, let's go from here. But if you read ahead to chapter 18, it sounds like the company didn't get up and leave the upper room until the beginning verses of chapter 18, not until Jesus was done praying through all of chapter 17. So one possibility is that get up, let's go from here was Jesus' signal to start getting up and start heading towards the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you think they cleaned up the Passover meal in the upper room after they were done? It's kind of hard for me to believe much cleaning was done during chapters 15 through 17. They seem like things you should sit and listen to and focus on, not like things that you say while you're passing dishes and wiping the table and stuff. Um, but some commentators believe that what Jesus said here was not get up, let's go, clean the room, but was about what he just said the verse before about the ruler of the world is coming. And it should be understood more along the lines of bring it. As in the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. He has no hold on me, no grasp on me, no claim on me. He doesn't own me. Well, let him bring whatever he's got. Come on, let's go right now. And Jesus does seem to have that level of confidence. And when I step back and think about it all, Jesus' perspective and his promises here take a lot of faith. For the disciples too, remember how lost they were on Easter morning before Jesus came by? I don't always see it now. I don't always see how he's winning. I don't always notice that he's with me. I get distracted from the mission. I listen to worldly views of my life and my meaning. My heart gets troubled and fearful. That's why it's so good that he brings us back to the basics why I need the Holy Spirit alongside me every day to remind me of Jesus' words, to teach me how to look at my life, to pray for me. No worries, he says. We're in this together. Trust and obey. I'm at home in you. You be at home in me. But more on that next week. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and your word and the love you have for us. Um, thank you for your comfort and peace. Please Continue to remind us of, of everything that you've taught us and help us to continue to grow in you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.